Hey, thank you, John. Thank you to Nature Calgary for this opportunity. What I want to talk to you tonight or today tonight about is the scenic geology of Alberta. I've had embarked on a, a, a venture. I call it geotourism. It's trying to let people know how Alberta's scenic landscapes form. Uh, they're so pretty. We've got so many of them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, here's a picture from Pine Ridge Lookout, Waterton Lakes. And that's not clouds in the bottom. That was on a smoky day. And that's smoke in the bottom. So just when you're entering Waterton Lakes National Park. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the way I've set today's talk up is um, the scenic geology of Alberta is a story of unbridled power. It's a story of drama. It's a story of glaciers and volcanoes long past. And it's a story about when banks fail. So I'm trying to popularize geology and get a message that, um, you know, if, if I put geology in my books, uh, on the title of my books, I may as well say astrophysics sometimes. It scares people. So I'm trying to make it exciting for people. Um, some of the sites in Alberta or from Alberta, here's Chief Mountain in the southwest, you see it from the southwest part of the province, Police Outpost Provincial Park, just a really nice little park. And you see Chief Mountain that dominates the landscape whenever you drive in southwest Alberta. Riding on Stone Provincial Park, Isonipe National Historic Site. And here you can see a misfit meandering river. You can see hoodoos. You can see the flat glacial, you can see the, the flat river valley. It's a meltwater channel. And there's a story there. And it just gives you this great scenery. Here's the scablands of Dinosaur Provincial Park. Everybody thinks about the dinosaurs and they're really important and they're really interesting to see, see there, but the landscape is so spectacular. And so this particular landform is called Scablands. Sulphur Gates Provincial Park uh, near Grand Cache. And this is called a water gap um, where, the, where the Smoky Rivers forced its way through these really thick and really tightly cemented gravels called a conglomerate. Vimy Peak, Waterton Lakes National Park, just so spectacular in itself. One of my favorite places is Milk River Canyon. And you can see Mil Milk River Canyon here, not riding on stone, but the same river, but further to the east and to the, well, to the southeast, southeast part of the province. And then the Sweetgrass Hills um, in the distance in northernmost Montana there, really a pretty area. Aretha Van Herc. Um, Alberta's one of Alberta's leading authors wrote about the book Visible Alberta is stunningly beautiful, but the poetry of geology is its secret language, a transcendent stratigraphy. What's stratigraphy? All it is is the layers of the rocks. Here you go to Dry Island Buffalo Jump and you can see the layering of these rocks, these beautiful pastel colors interrupted by the coal seams. Very, very spectacular. Red Rock Coulee. Uh, it's been called a moonscape, again, southeast Alberta. That's what I talk about in the book. And what I do in the book is I try and get people traveling out and exploring all across the province. Um, in the southern half of the province, we've got the grasslands. So there's more to see that way, as opposed to cutting and bullying your way through the boreal forest of the north. But there's still lots to see in central Alberta and in northern Alberta. I was lucky enough to work with two artists and they put art into the book. Um, and this way, you, the reader, can view the landscape um, through the eyes of artists and you can view the landscape through the eyes of a scientist or a geologist myself. So Brent Laycock, he put a bunch of eight pieces of art um, into the book. Lucy Carew uh, did a bunch of watercolors and put them into the book and they, they both captured the essence of Alberta from an artistic perspective, but you look at those pieces of art and you can see the geology in them as well. So put on your hiking boots, fill your car with gas. It's now time to explore and learn how Alberta's most scenic sites were created. <clears throat> we're gonna start by talking about unbridled power. The scenic geology of Alberta is about unbridled power. We're gonna to go to Waterton Lakes to get started there, southwest part of the province. And this is Buffalo Paddock. And what you see there is the leading edge of the Rocky Mountains, 1.5 billion year old rocks. And then in front of them is a glaciated landscape 
from the last glaciation, probably 12, 15,000 years ago. To set the stage um, for this part of the talk on power, Waterton, um, when those rocks that you see in Waterton Lakes National Park were deposited, um, they were south of the equator, it was hot and harsh, and there was not very much oxygen at the time. It really wasn't a very nice place. And those rocks are 1.5 billion years old. And Waterton was deposited sort of in this area here. The sediments at Waterton were deposited in a coastal environment. You see shallow marine, you see tidal flat deposits when you're there. At the time, there was no life on land at, the, at all. It was devoid of all life on land. Really, all we had was algae in the ocean. So I say that algae ruled the world at the time. And that's what you're seeing in this particular rock here. And you can see where I've traced out in red these curved features. These are like if you cut a Brussels sprout or a cabbage in half, cross-section wise, you can see it doming upwards. So these are stromatolites. And they were algal colonies that lived in the shallow seas. They're photosynthetic um, at the time. And on, here's another example. The slide on the left is from Waterton Lakes. And you can see the dome-shaped cabbage aspect to them. These are algae colonies. And then on the slide on the right, you can see a picture from Shark Bay, Australia. Shark Bay is a bay, it's a lagoon um, in a very hot, hot part of Australia. It's so hot that we get lots of evaporation from the lagoon. Um, the water evaporates and the salt concentration increases in that lagoon. And so there's no snails. There's nothing in, in the water in Shark Bay to eat the algae. It's much like snails in your fish tank. They, you have them in the fish tank to eat the algae. Well, conditions are so harsh in Shark Bay, but the, about the only thing that can live there is the algae, just like we had in Waterton Lakes National Park 1.5 billion years ago. So that sets the stage for Waterton. Um, if you go to Cameron Falls and you walk through those rocks and you used to be able to walk in through here and you'd see these algal stromatolites in there. You see them all through the park. And rather than putting a photo in, I put one of Brent Laycock's acrylic paintings just to give you an idea of his view of Cameron Falls and where I saw stromatolites. So we're gonna talk about unbridled power. Here's a Google Earth image and you can see Waterton, the village of Waterton in here, Crow's Nest Pass, Calgary in the top, Banff in the top. You can see these mountains that make up Waterton Lakes National Park and south into Glacier Park in the United States. Those rocks, and they're markedly different than the rocks from Banff and Jasper and going further north. They're different than the rocks in the Crow's Nest Pass. They're, that, this mass of rocks, north to south, is about 140 kilometers. It's about 40 kilometers wide. The sediments, there's about seven kilometers of them. There's seven kilometers thick. And part of our story is these rocks were buried 10 kilometers deep. Where did they come from? Well, the story here, and we're talking about unbridled power, is that this mass of rocks 160 million years ago was situated 140 kilometers to the southwest. And then with mountain building, that mass of rocks got pushed 140 kilometers to the northeast. And then for about 60 million years, there was erosion to finally give you the landscape that we see in Waterton now. So that mountain building, pushing those mountains from here to here was probably 165 to 60 million years ago. They were deeply buried at the time, probably around 10 kilometers deep. And then we had erosion. And it was that erosion that gives us that spectacular landscape that we see in Waterton and the rest of the Rockies. That's power. Consider the forces involved. We're still in Waterton. Take a look where the next couple of slides are going to be. And here is from Waterton River Valley viewpoint, looking north, and you can see the thrush sheet. You can imagine that thrush sheet being pushed 
at millimeters per year to the northeast to take it the position that it has right now. Go around the corner and the next slide is a version of how we started the talk off. There's the thrust sheet, the leading edge of that thrust sheet, and then glaciated deposits, giving you this very spectacular terrain there. Stunning landscapes. <clears throat> um, let's leave that. Let's go to Red Rock Coulee, natural area, south of Medicine Hat, um, in the middle of the prairies. And there are these large boulders. They're actually concretions made out of calcite. And they're, they're, they're all through these coulees in here. What's the story on them? And they're so beautiful and you can catch them with different light conditions and get really, really, really spectacular imagery. Well, they all originate from shallow marine mud rocks. There was a, a shallow seaway that occupied Alberta and there were volcanoes that took place west of, west of Alberta in British Columbia, in Washington. Those volcanoes erupted and deposited ash in the shallow seas, these mud rocks that you see here, deposited in the shallow sea, a volcanic layer, and uh, was deposited decimeters thick. And those concretions seem to be associated with that. There's that volcanic layer, and you don't see any concretions above it, volcanic ash layer. All the concretions are at that horizon or below it. This is when these rocks get really wet, they get very, very, or when they get wet, they get really, really slippery. And this is badlands topography. And we get about half a centimeter of erosion per year. So what happens is this mud rock and the ash erodes, gets washed downstream. These concretions just slip by gravity and make their way down slope. Look how these are all sitting at an angle. These ones here are horizontal, but on the slopes, you can just make out where they're starting to slip down. They're creeping down slope over time. So how did they form? There was a warm, shallow sea that occupied Alberta, Saskatchewan, part of Manitoba about 75 million years ago. Red Rock Coulee is located in southeast Alberta. It was a warm, shallow sea. The concretions formed just below the seafloor in a water depth in that sea that was a few meters to a few tens of meters deep. And as I say, they formed just below the seafloor. Calcite, due to chemical processes, would start to precipitate and form these really, really hard rocks. Their red, orange color is because there's a little bit of iron in them. And when the rocks are exposed, that iron oxidizes to give you that red color. And then there's also algae growing on, on the concretions as well. How do we know it was on a seafloor? You look at the, some of these concretions, you can see old wave ripples formed by, by currents on the seafloor. They've been preserved. You can see shellfish, you can see fish teeth, you can, you can see fish bones in there, organisms that lived in the ocean on the seafloor. You can see worm burrows that were living in the sand at the time. You can see how these concretions grew out concentrically. When you see some of them broken like this, you see these circular features on them showing how the concretions grew. And again, just spectacular scenery. So I put this in, in power because about 15 kilometers north of north, unbridled power, about 15 kilometers north of here at Bull's Head Butte, paleontologists have found a prognothodon. A prognothodon, this one, about the size of a small school bus, 10 meters long. It was on bridled power. It was at the top of the food chain. It ate what it wanted, when it wanted. And you can just take a look at that artist's rendition of it and just imagine what a ferocious animal it was. And so that was just north, not very far from Red Rock Coulee. As I say, it ate what it wanted, when it wanted. Here's Lucy's rendition, watercolor, Red Rock Coulee. And she's captured the starkness of it very, very nicely. Scenic geology of Alberta is about drama. For this one, we're going to start by going to Writing on Stone, Provincial Park, Ice and Ipe National Historic Site. And you can see Meltwater Channel. 
this flat bottom valley was cut by a glacial lake that catastrophically drained um, when the ice was melting and it cut this large wide flat bottom channel that was later reoccupied or occupied by the meandering Milk River. Um, one of the things that makes writing on stone so spectacular, so beautiful, are the hoodoos in the sandstone that line the walls. So most people know what hoodoos are. Hoodoos form when you have a resistant layer and less resistant layers of rocks. The more resistant layers, there's a little bit more cement in them. And so when wind, rain, snow falls, get in there, this is more, blow on these or affect these rocks and influence these rocks. This upper layer is more resistant to erosion than these lower layers. And we get a cap rock forming on top of all of these hoodoos. That's how they form. So take a look at the valley, take a look at these ridges, the, 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 the ridges that form the valley walls. What are those sands? I'm trying to give you a picture of what Alberta used to look like. This was an ancient shoreline 84 million years ago. At river level were mud rocks from, another, from a shallow sea, not the same one where the concretions were deposited in. And then this was a beach, it was a shoreline. And then this was rivers flowing to that shoreline with coal seams in there. So this, these cliffs were an ancient shoreline. What did Alberta look like at the time? The river were flowing from south to north and depositing sand into the shallow seaway. And in that seaway, there were tides and there were large waves. There were large waves breaking on the shoreline on this side. You could have surfed, you could have swam in through here. You could have taken your paddleboard and paddleboarded in, in the lagoon or in the bay back behind the shoreline. And again, you could have surfed out here about 84 million years ago. Again, I'm trying to give you pictures of how the spectacular scenery originated. So here's the river valley again and the hoodoos. So let's go on a guided tour. Remember, we're talking about drama here. And let's go down and look at some of the pictographs, some of the carvings on the, stone, on the walls. This is one of the battle scenes. And it's a battle scene of a battle that took place probably about 1866. And this is re as, as related by the Pecani elder um, named Bird Rattle in about 1920. And he tells about a war party of Gros Ventre, Crow and Plains Cree who were advancing on the Blackfoot people who were in the valley, who were camping in the valley. You can see the tents in through here. You can see a line of muskets with musket balls coming out. This is several meters across. Try and take a picture of it. It just doesn't make a very good picture. So one of the archaeologists, Jim Kaiser, Montana, made this, made this imagery, basically traced it from the photographs. You can see horses in through here. So you know that it's post-European contact. You can see the guns, which tell us the same thing. Um, there was an advancing party of about 300 of these warriors. Um, from three different tribes. Um, in the end, the Blackfoot people won this battle. So just an interesting story etched in the stone there. And a close-up of the guns, of the musket line. And it looks like muskets to me, and you can see the musket balls being fired out. Another battle scene, and it's markedly different than the first one. It's considered to be pre-contact. And what you see there are these large circular features, which are considered to be buffalo hide shields. Um, and they're so big, they covered most of the body of the warriors. Um, you could not ride a horse if you had shields of this size. You don't see any guns in this image either. And so they consider this to be um, pre-contact, pre-European contact, perhaps 1400 to 1600 common era. These inverted figures, are considered to be dead warriors, part of a skirmish. The sandstone is part of that old shoreline that we were talking about, lower down um, where the waves were breaking. If you were, could go straight up from here at that time, there'd be beautiful surf waves. <clears throat> Here's Lucy's rendition of Milk River Canyon. 
um, and she's captured it quite nicely. More drama, Cretaceous gold and the lost lemon gold mine, murder and madness. If you go up and down the Rocky Mountain foothills from Bragg Creek to the Montana border, you can find a series of gravel ridges like this. They have different expressions along the mountains, but they contain gold. And it's kind of an interesting little story. Is it related to the Lost Lemon Gold Mine? Not sure, but it makes a great tale. If you go down to the Frank Slide Interpreter Center in the Crow's Nest Pass and park in the parking lot, go up, take a walk up the ridge to the northeast and not a couple hundred meters, and you can see this ridge of conglomerate. It's the same conglomerate we're talking about. Um, if you take the hike um, around the interpretive center, it takes you right through the middle of this gravel. So a conglomerate is a cemented gravel. And the story we're going to make here is, is this related to the Lost Lemon Gold Mine? Mid to late 1800s, there were two trappers, Blackjack and Lemon. Supposedly, they discovered gold. Some of the stories say it's west of the divide in British Columbia. Some say it's east of the divide. Well, they, they, they'd had the, they collected their gold. One night, sitting around the fire, uh, Lemon killed Blackjack. Um, he became unstable from that. He, <coughs> he left the area, wandered down into Montana to the Tobacco Plains, told his story. He'd found his gold. He'd murdered his buddy. Um, right away after that, as you can imagine, he had all sorts of people that were tagging along, wanted to find where his gold was. People with really colorful names, such as Lafayette French, King Bearspaw, John McDougall, and uh, the Blackfoot woman, Cloud Walker. They all searched in vain for the gold. They never found it. There is a, it is said that those who look for the gold, they're going to, tragedy is going to come upon them. Tragic deaths fires, storms, serious illness. But when you look at that list of calamities, that's life in the 1800s. If you go through the legend of the Lost Lemon Gold Mine, names keep cropping up. Dutch Creek, Racehorse Creek, Highwood River, Gold Creek, Old Man River, all along the foothills, again, from Bright Creek south to the Montana border. If you go look at these ridges, from again, Bragg Creek, south to, the, to, the, to Montana, um, you can see that they define some ancient river channels that were flowing from west to east. And eight of them were identified. And they occur where these river names are, which is kind of interesting and giving, eh, I'll say, some kind of credence to the tale of the Lost Lemon Mine. In the gravels, there are certain type of pebbles and the details don't matter except they're important for our story here. There's volcanic pebbles, top left, and there's igneous pebbles. They're really unusual in the Rocky Mountains, really unusual. Where do they come from? Well, they originate from rocks in East Central British Columbia, the site of where the Caribou Gold Rush, these yellow dots all through here are gold bearing occurrences. So those igneous pebbles, those volcanic pebbles, were eroded from the volcanoes and mountains here at the time, along with the gold, and it was carried by, by rivers at least 400 kilometers to where we see it exposed in the Rocky Mountains right now. Is there gold? Yes. If you go to one of these outcrops, one of these overhang, one of these outcrops where there's an overhang, and you can see soil right below the overhang, collect it because it'll be loose. It's weathered over the thousands of years and that it's been there in that, in that cliff. Put it in a bag, take it down to the river, put it in your gold pan, and you may find anywhere from five to 20 gold colors. They're not very big, but they're there. Sometimes you find a little bit of platinum as well. More drama. Let's go to central Alberta. Let's go to the neutral hills. Disruption in the prairies. So near Consort, Alberta, neutral hills. And you see these spectacular hills that look like thrush sheets. They look like they're Rocky Mountain foothills, but they're in the wrong place. They're in the prairies, the middle of the prairies. On a Google Earth imagery, on a Google Earth image, this is what they look like. These ridges, 
in through here. They're so prominent that in 1857 18, to 1867, when Captain John Palliser was exploring Western Canada, he saw them, he put them on his maps. They were up to 70 meters high um, and, no, sorry, they're up to 120 meters high and they extend laterally for 70 kilometers east-west. So why are they there? They look like they've been pushed from the north. And the story is, when the during the last glaciation, when the ice was melting, when it was receding, there was an advance of the glacier. <coughs> and it thrust and it pushed these bedrock ridges. It incorporated ice that had been left behind in giant blocks. And so basically, these are ice thrust glacial ridges pushed forward, bulldozed effectively at the front of the ice when the ice was overall melting and there was a temporary re-advance. These ice blocks would melt out, but you see the word stagnant melting ice, and it would give you these kettle lakes that we see here in the prairies. Gooseberry Lake Provincial Park is a beautiful little park. And I think um, because it's not very saline, like this one on the left, it's, pro it's probably spring fed as well, or spring nourished. Spectacular scenery caused, created by the geology. Neutral hills. So why do they have that name? That was a territory to be shared. Um, the neutral hills, middle of the prairies, there's lots of fruit, berries in the summertime. In the wintertime, the hills provide protection from wind. There's, there's trees for firewood. And so the Crow and the Blackfoot people, and this is a story that's unsubstantiated, but it exists in the literature. The Crow and the Blackfeet, Blackfoot people, they were fighting. They would, there'd be turf wars. They would be warring. Um, one day, the Great Spirit, one night, he was quite upset with them, always fighting, always skirmishing. He put his finger down on the earth and lifted up these hills to create these ridges. The two tribes, they woke up in the morning, the crow on one side, the Blackfoot on the other, and they walked along the ridges till they came to this valley in the middle. They met, they smoked the peace pipe. And for that reason, this is called the neutral hills. So that's the drama here. More drama, Wally's Beach, um, a hike within a late Pleistocene landscape. Let's go Waterton Lakes, go northeast of Waterton Lakes to the St. Mary River Reservoir. It's southwest of McGrath, um, in that part, southwest of Alberta. And what you see is, just bear with me, is a reservoir. The best time to see this is in the spring or the late summer to early fall when the reservoir levels are down. Uh, Parks Alberta, uh, Alberta Parks and Environment has created a brand new campground here. It's a very rustic campground, but it's beautiful and hardly anybody knows about it. I guess 100, pe 100 new people know about it now, but it's really a nice place to go. Um, when the water levels are low, go for a couple kilometer walk out to here, out to the edge of the reservoir. And what you might find if you're lucky are mammoth tracks, woolly mammoth tracks, traipsing that were, they were traipsing through the sediment there. Here's another expression, expression of them in another type, in a mudstone. And so mammoth tracks, you might, oh, these mammoth tracks, they're up to 50 centimeters across. Um, hundreds of them have been found and um, some, some of them are juveniles. So there may be young elephants, woolly mammoths wandering with their mothers um, across through there. There are camel or horse footprints um, in the sediments there as well. <clears throat> there are tools. Um, that were used for butchering the animals. And that's part of the story here, part of the drama. Um, these have been dated, these, these, these bones have been dated at 13,300 years ago. And what the archaeologists have found there is seven butchered horses and camels. They also found stone tools with proteins on them. Um, the stone tools were used to butcher the animals, so blood, there's some of the proteins on them. It's really, really an interesting story. And, oh, I just lost the name of the arrowheads. Um, yeah, thir they're 13,300 years old. Uh, next photo. And so, <clears throat> bear with me, sorry. 
if you wander around there, you can find tools, um, scrapers, bone breakers. You can find some of the bones. Remember, you're not supposed to touch them. You're, or you should leave them if you go out there wandering about. Um, there is active research going on by a couple of institutions uh, on an ongoing basis. So this photograph kind of shows what the climate would have been like at the time. 13,300 years ago, there were still glaciers in through here. You can see the mountains not very far off to the west. It would have been windy all the time. The, the Laurentide ice sheet was probably several hundred kilometers to the north. Uh, it had melted back while the ice had advanced in these valleys, but it was harsh. Uh, it would have been step-like and there would have been very few trees. It wouldn't have been a very nice place at all. Here's Lucy Carew's rendition of Wally's Beach. And again, she's captured the starkness of it. <clears throat> More drama, dinosaurs perish, meteor impacts and never ending floods. Uh, for this, we're gonna go to Dry Island Buffalo Jump on the, uh, on, on the Ridger River north of Three Hills and uh, south of Delburn on Highway 21. If you go to one of the ridges off to the east, down towards the river on the right-hand side of this photo, um, the paleontologists have found bone beds. They found bone beds of, of Albertosaurus. And in the bone beds here at Dry Island, um, in one, one of the deposits, in one of the bone beds, they found enough bone beds that they could say that it came from 26 specimens. Perhaps there was a, a, a pack of them there. The specimens range in age from two to 24 years. Uh, there were no juveniles younger than two. Not sure of the implications of that, but they suggest from the, that collection that maybe Albertosaurus which eventually evolved into Tyrannosaurus rex, but maybe Albertosaurus was hunting in packs. This picture, this artist's rendition, just shows how nasty he would have been. So why are the bones concentrated like that? Here are some images from, of wildebeest trying to cross a river in Kenya. Wildebeest are herbivores, they eat plants, but they try and cross rivers um, when the rivers are in flood, and the wildebeest are migrating. They cross these rivers, they drown in the river. Um, after the, when the water levels go down, you get carcasses all along the river like this, being scavenged by the, in this instance, by these birds. At night, it'll be the hyenas and other animals like that. And then when the skeletons, all that's left is the skeletons and, and, and with a little bit of meat and fur on it, the next flood, a few years later, will pick up these skeletons, transport them downstream and deposit them in a deposit and it, that would be a bone bed. That's probably how the concentrations of Albertosaurus were developed. 66.5 million years ago, a meteorite hit the earth. Um, it was 20 kilometers across and created a crater in the Yucatan Peninsula. And that crater was 200 kilometers across. Instantly, many, 76% uh, of all life on earth died. Um, and if you go to Dry Island Buffalo Jump, that instant in time when the meteorite hit the earth is located right here right at the base of this little coal seam. Very difficult to get up. It's a steep cliff here. The geologists, the paleontologists, uh, palynologists have studied this uh, several kilometers downstream where there's easy access to it. But that instant in time when the meteorite hit the earth is right here. If you go to this spot several kilometers to the south, that instant in time is right there. <clears throat> So when the meteorite hit the earth, instantly across North America, there were giant fires. Um, darkness from the ejected debris from that impact, as well as soot. There was nitric acid rain. There were aerosols, uh, sulfuric acid aerosols. They cooled the earth. They called it, we, the, the people that study these um, impacts call it nucle nuclear, nuclear winter. And then there was so much CO2 that was put into the atmosphere because the meteorite hit a carbonate environment filled with um, calcium carbonate caused intense global warming. 
76% of all species died in an instant. The only way to describe it is a cataclysm. Drama. Now this is gonna be a little bit different type of drama. Um, there's a sweet little park northwest of Calgary called Big Hill Springs Provincial Park. And most of you have probably been there. Um, great little waterfalls, great little tufa deposits. Um, it's spring fed, water temperature year round is six or seven degrees. It flows year round, it doesn't freeze up. And there's calcium carbonate in these rocks um, that the water picks up when it's flowing through the bedrock. And that calcium carbonate comes out of the water, comes out of solution, and it coats everything in its path. Here's a block of material, and there's a, a stick, a stump right here, a piece of wood that's been covered by calcium carbonate. There's twigs in through here. There's moss and lichen pieces, and they're, they're just covered with this calcium carbonate as the ox, as, as the, basically, as the oxygen comes out of the water. Now, the reason I put this down, Big Hill Springs, such a beautiful little park, um, well, we'll get there in a second. Um, the tufa has created these dams, and there's several of them. They're several meters high and up to a couple hundred meters across the park. Some are pretty small. Um, some people suggest that they're beaver dams. I don't think that is the case, but I wouldn't argue about it. So the reason for bringing this up in the drama part is right now there's a motion. There's the, they're, 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 they want to build a gravel pit here. They want to build a gravel pit and the margins of that gravel pit will be 800 meters away from Big Hill Springs Park. There is a strong chance that if that gravel pit is constructed and is completed as planned, Big Hill Springs could dry up. Big Hill Springs, the water quality could be dramatically affected. If you're interested, you got your pen handy, just look up Big Hill Creek Preservation Society and go to their website. They could probably use your support. Let's leave the drama. Let's go to the scenic geology of Alberta is about glaciers and volcanoes long past. Alberta, last glaciation, Saskatchewan, Western Canada was covered by ice. There was ice from the mountains, the Cordilleran ice sheet. There was ice from the north, the Laurentide ice sheet. It was up to almost four kilometers thick in Northern Alberta. Calgary, it was a kilometer and a half thick probably. If you draw a line from north to south, from the territory's border down to Montana, you can see what the ice profile would have looked like. And the, you can also see the topography of the land that it flowed on. The ice actually flowed up the topography. The direction that an ice, the ice flows is defined by its upper surface here. But it's really interesting that the ice flowed uphill um, because it was so thick. Just some maps showing you what Alberta looked like and how the ice melted. So 22,000 years ago, we'll say to 18,000 years ago, ice covered all of Alberta except for a few spots. These were noon attacks. The ice started to melt. Ice melts, lots of ice gives you lots of water, gives you lots of lakes, gives you lots of meltwater channels, lots of evidence for lakes in the province. We'll come back here in a minute. The ice keeps melting back. We're gonna to go to Edmonton briefly. I know you don't wanna hear about Edmonton, but there's a good story there. Ice keeps melting back. And by 10,300 years ago, it had left the province. Part of that ice, part of that glaciation and the two ice masses is the origin of Okotok. The Okotok's erratic and everybody's been there. Everybody knows about it. So why is the Okotoks erratic there? So two ice masses, the, the Cordillera ice mass, the Laurentide ice mass, there was at Mount Edith Cavell, valley glaciers flowing down the Athabasca River Valley out from Mount Edith Cavell out to Hinton. There was a landslide on Mount Edith Cavell and millions of tons of rocks were deposited onto the ice, came out, got to Hinton, bumped into the Laurentide ice sheet and was deflected southwards. And those giant blocks from the hundreds of millions of tons of material from Mount Edith Cavell were deposited 
all along the rocky, the front of the Rocky Mountain foothills. There's Mount Edith Cavell, and it's a very distinctive quartzite that fell onto the Valley Glacier. Sometimes that just doesn't advance when you push the button. Um, what did that look like? What could that have looked like? Here's an example from the Alaska range in Alaska, obviously. There was an earthquake and a landslide. On these mountains, these landslides went out on the glacier here and here, and that debris was carried out, just like what happened at Mount Edith Cavell. We don't know what triggered it, and that's how the Okotoks erratic got to where it was, is. Let's look at Calgary. We're gonna to go to Nose Hill for this one. And we're gonna look at um, the influence of some of the glaciation here. Here's a, a panoramic shot from Hawkwood, just west of Nose Hill. And what you can see, Nose Hill in the distance, downtown Calgary, Bow River Valley, Signal Hill across to the south, Rocky Mountains in the distance. And way in the distance on the right would be Cochrane. When the ice was melting, there were the two ice masses, remember? Laurentide ice sheet, the big one, and the Cordilleran ice sheet. In this instance, the Bow Valley Glacier that flowed down the Bow River. The ice was melting, lots of water, and we had Glacial Lake Calgary being formed. And it filled the river valleys. Another way to look at this, um, a Google Earth image, and there's Nose Hill here. Um, Glacial Lake Calgary, was probably as high as John Laurie Boulevard. When they were constructing John Laurie Boulevard, they found old beach deposits from that lake. Don't know where it went off to the north and off to the west. Just trying to give you a picture what it looked like. University of Calgary, um, where the library is, was probably under 40 meters of lake water. The lake was as high as 64th Avenue in through here. And here's another erratic in the lower left of this photograph that was carried by the ice from Mount Edith Cavell. Here's just some maps, just to look at. The first, the oldest glaciation um, that we've got evidence for in Calgary came from the west, came down the Bow River Valley. And then we had the Laurentide Ice Sheet. It advanced, it started to melt. The two ice masses were melting. And you had Glacial Lake Calgary, which is all of these lakes, and it had different shapes as the ice melted. You can see these lake sediments um, in below varsity. You can see them if you go to Fish Creek, if you're from the south part of the city. Basically, most of our river valleys have them. So Calgary, the glacial history, only one major glaciation affected the Calgary area. Um, there were, do, I call it dueling glaciers. The Laurentide Ice Sheet, the big one from the north, and the Cordilleran from the mountains. Next time you go outside, look up. Try and imagine a kilometer and a half of ice being above you. Ice was melted from and gone from Calgary by about 15,000 years ago. Glaciers long past. Let's go north. Let's go to Elk Island National Park. Just a, a, a great natural area. And at Elk Island Park, what it's characterized by is low-lying hills, shallow lakes, and wetlands. You can see beaver dams in through here in the distance, cut down beaver trees. So what's the story on Elk Island National Park? So glaciation, during the maximum of the glaciation, Elk Island National Park, what it is now, was actually on a little highland, a little bit high, topographically high, and the ice streamed around it on either side. And as a result, on either side of the Cooking Lake area, Elk Island National Park area, the land is really, really flat on both sides. But Elk Island National Park, where it is, is was this old subtle highland. And we've got a different type of topography. Look off to the Northeast, and you can see this flat streamlined country. Go west to Sherwood Park and you see the same thing. The ice streamed around that little upland. And then when the ice, no, before we go there, if you draw a cross section across Elk Island National Park, you can see the topography, you can see the elevation, the ice stream, one of them was here, the other one was on this side. This 
is a topographically high area. And when the ice started to melt, a, a block of ice that was probably hundreds of meters thick, perhaps even a kilometer thick, stagnated and melted in place here to give you this hummocky terrain, which is such a great ecosystem for birds, for beavers, for other animals and, and all related animals in, in central Alberta. It gives you this topography that you see here, these wetlands. It's, it's a bird breeding factory. Um, and this topography, and the names don't matter except they're descriptive. Prairie mounds, rimmed ridges, ice walled lake plains. You can picture this country with these descriptions, prairie donuts. Let's leave that. Let's leave the glaciers. Let's go to volcanoes long past. Let's go to Southwest Alberta, Crow's Nest Pass, 103 million years ago. So what we have in Crow's Nest Pass is a range of mountains, which are made up of these vol of volcanic rocks. There was a volcanic eruption that laid down hundreds of meters of volcanic sediments, again, 103 million years ago. And there, there's one of the various pictures of it. There's those rocks in through here, overlain by glacial till from the ice that flowed down that valley. The volcano probably resembled something like this. It was explosive. Um, initially, it was effusive. Basically, stuff just flowed out quietly. And then it became explosive. You see evidence in the Crow's Nest Volcanics of Nuay Ardans. And what they are, are, are hot air flows where air temperatures were probably 1,000 degrees Celsius. They, inst they hit trees on the side of the mountain and instantly charred them. You see evidence of debris flows. But the interesting thing about the Crow's Nest Volcanics is that volcano erupted where, Cran where Cranbrook is now. And it emplaced three, at least 300 meters of material, a big broad cone shape to it. And then that material was, was buried and pushed northeast. It was pushed northeast to the Coleman area. It was pushed by mountain building processes about 90 some kilometers to where we see it with those spectacular ridges in the Crow's Nest Pass. We have no active volcanoes in Alberta. We only have these Cretaceous ones here and a few and evidence of other ones in a few other places. Let's leave glaciers and volcanoes. The scenic geology is, of Alberta is about when banks fail. We're gonna to go to Edmonton. Nobody wants to go to Edmonton, but it's on a very flat lake plain. It's built much like Calgary on a glacier lake bottom. And then it's been dissected, cut by the North Saskatchewan River. It's a very flat lake plain. That glacial lake, was pretty large. There's a scale bar there. There's the city of Edmonton. There was ice on all sides and water was draining into this area here to give you the lake sediments that we have um, in Edmonton on which Edmonton is built. Because Edmonton is built on that very flat lake bottom, it's very, very flat. It's one thing that's always amazed me is how flat Edmonton is, except where the river valley is. And so the ice melted, the landscape lifted up and because of the weight of the ice coming off and the river down cut to give you this deep entrenched valley. There's another Google Earth image. And the nature of rivers, meandering rivers, is they erode on one side and then they, they deposit on another side. The red line is what would be considered the deepest part of the river. It is, the, is, we call it, the geologists call it the Talweg, T-H-A-L-W-E-G, Talweg, A-G. Um, and so it, it shows where you get erosion, it shows where you get deposition. So we're interested in where erosion is taking place. But where deposition takes place is usually right opposite where the erosion takes place. And sand and gravel is deposited here makes for great gravel pits, makes for great golf courses. This is on a river terrace. Then after you feel guilty because you've got a gravel pit in the middle of your city, you make this into a park. 
So it's Terwilliger Park, again, a great little park. Olescu River Valley Park in through here. But we're interested in why banks fail. So look at those steep cliffs. And so what we've got is the North, is the North Saskatchewan River undercutting, undercutting the riverbank in through here, undercutting the riverbank in through here. And as a result, we get landslides, we get bank failure. And there's other reasons that contribute to that bank failure, but the big one is the river erodes and cuts into the bank. Here's one of the river banks, one of the bank failures that took place initially 1989, Don dropped here, Don dropped here, 2002. There used to be a road right here called Keeler Road. Um, Edmonton, they call this the end of the world. They've made it into a nice little park, Keeler Point um, within, within a very affluent neighborhood. And it's really nice. And they've taken that old abandoned river the bank failures, the landslides, and made it into this great little park. And I'm pretty impressed with that. The old road is right there when banks fail. Go further north, go to the Tatapis River, um, where the highway crosses the Peace River. There is the town of Peace River. And wherever I've marked S, slumps, they're bank failures. This whole bank is nothing but bank failures, nothing but landslides. Look at where the railroad is. You go there and they're always repairing the road. They're always repairing the railroad when banks fail. Um, when banks fail, Crow's Nest Pass, not really bank failure, but it's a long comparable theme. So let's go back down Southwest Alberta. Let's look at um, the Frank Slide. And there is the Frank slide on Turtle Mountain, and there's the debris from Frank slide. April 29th, 1903. This is Canada's largest landslide. Um, the railroad and the highway were blocked. Uh, the railroad hired a thousand people. They had the road cleared within, they had the railway cleared within a month. It took a couple years uh, for the road to be cleared. But that's business versus government, pretty impressive. Half the town of Frank was destroyed and 90 at least 90 people died. The reason for it, to give you that spectacular scenery at Frank Slide is it's all related to geology. We had the rocks were folded, bent with mountain building processes. When you bend a layer of rocks, they become weaker. They slip past one another. And then those rocks were thrust. They were pushed by mountain building processes. There were been multiple glaciations in that, in that river valley. Um, coal mining likely contributed at the base of the mountain. Some people say coal mining contributed to the slide. So we had folded rocks. We had thrust rocks. We had coal mining. That's likely what triggered the, the uh, Frank slide on Turtle Mountain. There is some of the debris giant blocks that went down one side of the mountain, rode up on the other side. So the scenic geology of Alberta is a story of unbridled power. It's a story of drama. It's a story of glaciers and volcanoes long past. And it's a story, as I've shown you, of banks, of when banks fail. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I'd like to acknowledge the Canadian Geological Foundation for a book grant that I got to publish the book, as well as Alberta government. Uh, they provided a grant to publish the book as well. So I appreciate both of them. If you're interested in the book, um, the book is in just about every bookstore across Alberta. Um, I'm a firm believer, support your local bookseller. Um, go to Owl's Nest, Pages on Kensington, Stealing Home, um, I consider Chapters Indigo to be local. They're not independent, but they're local. Go to Shelf Life. And Stuff for Men also carries it as well. So again, thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks, Dale. That was a, a great presentation. And it just shows to me one couple of things. Certainly one thing is what a great province we have to be able to live in here and 
you know, if a couple hours of driving here and there, certainly from Calgary, we can touch on most of what you've been talking about tonight. So I think that's uh, that's some fabulous uh, could do for for you, but certainly for Alberta that we have these landscapes to to explore. Um, so yeah, I, I just say if you have any questions, you're welcome to um, put them into the chat, uh, and then I can relay them to uh, Dale. Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, let's go down, down. see what I got here. Sound is fine. We can try and just, uh... So you talked about the gold that was found in those gravels, those conglomerates. And, but I was going to ask the question, where did, what was the source rock? But you actually said it, later on that it was from, uh, from much further west. Yeah, it would be from where in basically it, late 1800s in the Caribous. Um, it was that that area. I remember going on a field trip once, a geological field trip, and we went to some of the mines. And it was, these are, I'll call them little mom and pop operations, but they would have big D8 cats and stuff like that. And you could see in the river gravels, you could see nuggets of gold the size of my AirPods. I was just so amazed to see that. That was so impressive. So the question becomes is how did the gold get across the continental divide into Alberta? Continental divide did not exist in the same place that it did right now. The continental divide over geologic time has shifted laterally, back and forth laterally. And it seems like for a period of time, the continental divide at the time shifted further to the west and tapped into those rocks that contain the gold. And so, you know, in really mountainous terrain, you get river switching going on all the time. An example would be the Columbia River or the Fraser River, how it's changed course, even, um, I'll, I don't know what the time frame is. I'm going to say over the last several tens of thousands of years, a uh, few million years. Uh, little, little, little glaciations would have caused some of it, but also uh, irregularities, no, that's wrong, thrust faulting can shift it. If you look at you ask the question, you're going to get it. If you go down south of Invermere, Windermere, and I can't remember the name of the town, um, the Fraser River is so close to the headwaters of the Fraser is so close to the headwaters of the Columbia. And you could see river capture occurring so easily if something happened uh, to change the topography a little bit that one river might change direction completely and the Columbia could actually start flowing south. I exaggerate, but when you go see how close those headwaters are, it wouldn't take much to get it switch. And that's the way, um, what was the question? The question was related to the- Getting, the, getting the gold across the divide. Yeah. And yeah. It, it'd be like that. So the divide was further to the West than where it is now. Great to know. Uh, another question related. So, so you, you talked about the neutral hills and that they were basically pushed, uh, the glaciers coming from the North pushed them up. Um, does that possibly mean that there are diamonds in the neutral hills if those glaciers were traversing across Kimberlite pi pipes further north and then picking up diamonds and depositing in those uh, up those uh, those hills? Okay, I'm going to say yes, there is the possibility, but the possibility is going to be pretty slim because uh, again, I think if I'm, I'm, I'm dredging my memory, Kimberlites, we found Kimberlites up at Fort, Fort McMurray. Um, we found evidence of the, of the Kimberlites and, and that, and, and that would, and I don't think, and I could be wrong, that there's any Kimberlites between Neutral Hills and Fort McMurray. So that's a long ways. And you don't know that with the way the, the ice was flowing, would they have taken them to the Neutral Hills? So yeah, it's an idea. Yes, it could be there, but I wouldn't go staking land there. Um, and I don't, oh. We'll digress. 20 years ago, um, the Alberta government, the Canadian government, the geological surveys, the Beers, the big dining mining company, they were doing traverses and transects all the way all across uh, the prairies looking for kimberlites. Um, I don't remember seeing any indicator minerals, let's say, as I'm saying, in that neck of the woods. So I can't yeah, make possibility, any possibility, but not a, not a very big possibility. Okay. 
Okay, just scrolling down through the chat here. Lots of wonderful presentations. How do we date to 1.5 million years, the time that, and I, that's all it says. So how do we date to 1.5 million years, the time that? So so we're talking the 1.5 billion years. That would million, be million, sorry, 1.5 oh, million. million. Just bear with me. Why did I say, did I ever say 1.5 million? Hmm. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, you can you can date rocks that are that age by the way certain minerals decay, um, and then we you take you take the rocks into the lab and you can look at the way the rocks are 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 decaying. There's also um, radioactivity, um, and it'll say, let's say in zircons, it'll send tracks along um, zircons. Zircons just another type of sand grain. So there's different ways of doing it. And usually it's done by dating the minerals and the way the minerals are altered over time. Um, I'll say usually related to radioactive um, processes or radioactive decay. And I think uh, it does say 1.5 million, but I don't think I used that. It would be 1.5 billion. And that refers to Waterton area. I mean, Waterton, yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, another question is a person saying that they would love to explore the Milk River uh, writing on stone area. Um, where would be a good place to find accommodation other than camping? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm laughing because I've often wondered that. I've gone searching for Airbnbs and things like that. Uh, and they're few and far between. Be few and far between. I used to stay in Milk River. Okay, so as when I've gone down there, I've stayed in the campground in Milk River. Um, it is, used to be really, really nice. It deteriorated in my mind, but somebody's told me it's gotten better. So that's just in the north end of town. Another time, uh, I even hate to say it, another time there's really an old motel that's really clean right in Coots. And the reason I say Coots is, you know, what was going on in Coots. But the little motel in Coots is really, really a nice one. It's old. It's, it's virtually rustic. Um, he's got great barbecues in that there that you could use outside. And, you know, I had a group of people there once. They loved it. So Milk River Motel, Coots Motel, uh, do the Airbnb thing and look for him. Um, I, I haven't looked for Airbnb in a little bit. You could do it some, if you don't like camping, um, and it's going to be late now, but try the glamping. Uh, they've got those three or four little buildings where you're in, in Riding on Stone Provincial Park, uh, where you can, you don't have to take your own tent and you're off the ground and things like that. Excellent. Um, I did a clamping thing up in Elk Island and you're absolutely correct. They're great facilities. Um, so certainly take advantage of it. Uh, are there any um, instruments monitoring Turtle Mountain to see if there's any possibility of, of future slides? Yeah, there's going to be a slide. Um, the Alberta Geological Survey has an active monitoring program going on. Uh, just before I released the book, so eight, nine months ago, I contacted the survey and it was active at the time. And the only reason I bring that up is you never know with government cuts what can happen. So they have sensors and monitors at the top of the mountain and there are cracks which are getting wider and there's a little bit of down dropping for some of those blocks. Sometimes you might be at uh, Frank Slide Interpretive Center or you might be at the bottom of the valley. You might actually see a large, I'm not gonna call it a boulder, a large block come tumbling down or you might hear it. So yeah, it's gonna happen someday. Don't know if it'll be in our lifespan or not, but it, it might. Okay. Uh, question about amylites. Um, question is, uh, do you have any insight as to why amylite is only found in Southern Alberta? And why does it have those incredible vibrant colors? Um, only in general terms. So you only find it in that one area. And the way it was described or explained to me, as it's, it's basically very specific. Um, pressure and temperature conditions um, that preserve that really, really spectacular color that you see and that which a lot of people think might reflect some of the original luster of the, of the original ammonites. 
because you know you you go further to the north and you don't quite find it now i say that at the same time i've picked up fossils of bivalves clams 100 million year old bivalves up in peace river and sometimes you can find that nacreous luster there so there's some reason and i think it's related to the temperature pressure of those marine shales or the bear paw formation that those colors are preserved beyond that i haven't read or heard anything for a long time about it so i hope hopefully that helps but i have found other fossils that you do find that will say that nacreous luster in them not often but every so often you do well, thanks dale uh one question about drumlins uh, they're noticeable when you're driving west on the Trans-Canada Highway, going through Morley Flats. Um, do, do, do you have any uh, theory as to how they were formed? Did, and well, Sorry, my hearing. Did you say drumlins? Drumlins, correct. Yeah, sure. They formed at the bottom of the ice. And so they, they formed from the Bow River Glacier, which was flowing from west to east at the bottom of the ice. And one of the interesting things about drumlins is they're streamlined. They're blunt in the upstream end. I think I've got that right. And they taper in the down ice direction. And that, that helps the ice flow over them. They've got the same shape to a degree as a chicken egg and the same principle when the egg comes out of the chicken. So bottom of the ice during the last glaciation, probably 12 to 14,000 years ago. And then when the ice was starting to recede and melt back, some of the... Uh, the drumlins were modified by rivers flowing out, meltwater channels, meltwater flowing off the ice. And you can see some of that modification, um, slight alteration. Great, thanks, Dale. Question about badlands. They seem to extend from a far distance north to the south in various locales. Are they all connected? Uh, I don't know what, you, what the question means by connected, but yes, they're all related, but they're not connected where they're all joined up. So, bad, so basically where our Alberta badlands occur are where we have the Cretaceous rocks in the prairies. Um, the badlands, they weren't, the, the, the Cretaceous rocks there were not deeply buried and therefore they're not tightly or deeply cemented like the same age rocks you might get when you go into the mountains. Mountains are deeply buried, so they're really, the rocks that you see are really hard. In the middle of the prairies and the badlands, not as deeply buried, so they're more easily eroded. And if you remember when I talked about, oh, the coolies, sorry, the, 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 the concretions, red rock coolie, I said that rate of erosion in the badlands is half a centimeter. So that's because the rocks are so not, not they're not as well cemented and so you get that rate of erosion so that way they are all re all related to the cretaceous rocks um in which they occur hopefully i answered the question that way great thanks dale a question about rocks appearing in fields uh farmland gardens uh what um causes them to be thrust to the surface so those rocks that you see in the field they actually most of them are uh boulders that were carried by the glaciers and so they were on the glacier, they were in the glacier, um, and usually they're with clay. And, and, and so they were transported by the ice from the north. Most of them in the prairies are coming out of northern Alberta, northern Saskatchewan, those areas. Now, part of the question is, um, why do you see them at the surface? Well, over time, what I found, I'm a farm boy a long time ago, over the years, you'd pick the rocks in a field and eventually they you'd get more and more where you'd picked a few years before. Frost action also pushes them up. So they're in the till, in the clay stone, and the, the frost action actually pushes them up. So two answers, two slightly different things. Why are they at the top? Well, it's frost action, freeze thaw, uh, but they're carried by the ice. My question, if you, if you happen to find a stone tool, uh, in your yard or in a field, uh, is there some place you should be contacting or a person you should contact, or do you just keep it? No, Jesus. No, you should definitely, sorry, my apologies for saying that. Um, you should definitely contact the museum in Edmonton, because that, that's our, our archaeological museum. Now, Terrell is more for paleontology, um, so it's the Royal 
Oh, it's the Royal Alberta Museum. And that's where our, our, the province's archaeologists are. Um, you know, no, you should, re, you should report them. Let, it, let, let them know where it's from. Okay. Uh, if you found it on the surface, yeah, I think you can keep it as what the, what the rules are. If you dig it out, well, it could be $50,000 or five years in jail. Uh, so let them know because it's a contribution to our understanding the natural heritage of Alberta. Yeah, a good response there, Dale. Uh, how was the Crow's Nest Mountain formed? It has that peculiar shape, kind of an isolated shape? Just, I'm just thinking, so Crow's Nest Mountain, um, it was part of a bigger, sorry, I'm just laughing. People just love to test me. That's all this is. It, it, <laughs> it's part of a, oh, it's, it's part of a bigger thrust sheet. So basically we had mountain building and there was a thrust sheet and it pushed a big wedge of rocks like this. And then we had erosion going on and really Crow's Nest Mountain is just an erosional piece of that bigger thrust sheet, the Lewis thrust sheet um, that put those rocks in place. And so geologists call Crow's Nest Mountain a clippa, K-L-I-P-P-E. Uh, so it is, it, so summarize, Crow's Nest Mountain is a fragment of a much larger thrush sheet. And so all the rocks around it have been eroded. And so you just see that piece. You can see the, the thrust fault at the bottom. Uh, they're Devonian Mississippian carbonates, 300 million years old. And they're sitting on top of about 100 million year old rocks. And that contact where you go from 100 million year old rocks to the 300 million year old rocks, there's a thrust there. And that thrust extends down into Montana and it extends up into Kananaskis country. In this place, it's just a little eroded piece that's left over in this case. Great. Um, you showed t pictures or uh, artist conception of the uh, Chikulu uh, meteor striking the earth or asteroid whatever it was is it likely to, to happen again and are we protected from that no it's going to happen again um they happen all the time um you know it, when you when you see a falling star if you see a shooting star that's a piece of meteor that and it might only be sand size that's hitting the earth um we are being you know there are people, there are agencies that are monitoring asteroids. And every so often you'll see an alert that says, oh, there's gonna be an asteroid passing by the earth, many tens or hundreds of million, uh, hundreds, many tens of millions of miles away. We've had multiple meteor impacts um, on earth over time. Uh, so it will occur. That was one of the bigger ones. Uh, you know, you've, people may have heard of, um, an explosion, a meteor, I'll call it a meteor, it wasn't a meteor, it might have been an asteroid explosion that took place in Alaska at the turn of the last century. And it devastated and knocked down trees for tens and tens of probably hundreds of square kilometers. Um, if that had happened over a city, it would have not leveled all, all of the buildings in that city. The, I think that's called a Yakuts, and I could be wrong in that name. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, yeah, they, they're they're it's going to happen. Won't necessarily be a big one like that, but they, they take place. Okay. Oh, uh, look, no nope, digression. Um, if you've been following the news in the last couple of days, a meteor, a very small meteor hit a dog house. The dog house uh, has got a hole the size of a fist in it, a big fist. And that dog house is probably going to sell for $300,000. And that was just happened in the last little while. But the auction with Sotheby's, it's happening as you as we speak right now. There, I digressed again. Yeah, actually, that's a good, brought up something in my mind. Um, I know there was uh, a program I was watching where you know there are meteorites striking the Earth, like micro meteorites striking the Earth every day, tons and tons of them. And this guy was actually saying what you can do is you can take the um, say the water flowing off of your roof and the sediments that collect in your east troughs, et cetera, you can actually <laughs> collect all that and then have a have a, a, um, a magnet, a strong magnet pass it across those sediments. And it's quite a good possibility that you will pick up a, a micrometeorite because they're, you know, they're, you know, they're attracted to magnets. So, uh, so we are being bombarded all, uh, as we speak right now. All the time, exactly. Uh, 
Um, there's a good question about geology in terms of, are there any local geology groups around we can join and learn more of uh, the area? A <laughs> great question. No. No, sorry, you just got me there. That's really amazing that there isn't. And somebody else in the audience might know of one, but um, there's professional societies, but not, there's rock and mineral clubs, but they're a little bit different. So right now I'm gonna say no. And it, that's really a great question. And that's mm. really something that we need. I, we need another volunteer. I'm not going to look after that. <laughs> that somebody could get that going. Well, I, I thought it's something like uh, maybe Nature Calgary can ex explore to find out if there are some geologists, whether there are members or, or not. That maybe we could set up a little subgroup or because we, we have the bird study group. Uh, yeah. We used to have a botany study group. Maybe it's time to have a, a geological kind of study group and and use your book as a yeah. as a direction as to where to go to uh, explore the local geology. There is a paleontological group which is um, which go you know they 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 go and look at fossils, but it's they focus mostly on the paleontology. Now, I think I think in Nature Calgary that would be a great little subchapter. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, just a quick answer to those. So there's a little pop up that came about joining the bird study group. If you're a member of uh, Nature Calgary, uh, you automatically get uh, become a member of the bird study group. The bird study group is a subgroup of of Nature Calgary. So what, if you join Nature Calgary, you you're, you can be join the uh, the uh, bird study group and take part in their activities and presentations. So I think uh, we're pretty well. There's an Edmonton Geological Society. That's good. Yeah, there uh, is. Yeah. There, there is. There's definitely that. All right. Well, I think um, I think we'll uh, end our our, our, uh, our uh, question period. Uh, lots of great questions. I thank all the attendees for uh, uh, providing all those interesting uh, food for thoughts or questions that uh, could get Dale to elaborate on. That was great. And certainly on behalf of Nature Calgary again, Dale, what a great presentation. It was a great pleasure to have you uh, enlighten us about the, the scenic geology of Alberta. And um, hopefully we can have you come back at some future date with other projects or books you might be working on. So wow. 